This is Unique Smiles, the Facial Paralysis Podcast, and I'm your host, Brian April. Today on our podcast, I am joined by Andrea Devine, and Andrea has had facial paralysis since she was uh, very, very young. I met her through an online support group, and I think she has a a fascinating story to tell. So, uh, Andrea, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. Thanks, Brian. So, let's just kind of jump right into it. Tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. So, when I was a month old, my grandma noticed a, um, a lump of sorts growing on the left side of my face, and... My family monitored it, and it was starting to get bigger. And, of course, my parents sought medical attention for it. And initially, doctors weren't too concerned about it. But um, within a very short period of time, over the course of three months, actually, it grew into a grapefruit-sized benign tumor. And so at four and a half months of age, I had surgery to have that removed, and uh, it was life or death. You you could definitely say as the tumor was growing into my windpipe area and into my brain, so it was a very important operation for me to have. And during that procedure, my my tumor was entangled with nerves and, and things, and with me being as tiny as I was, there was an accidental kind of a slip, I guess, with the scalpel in my in my situation here, and the surgeon nicked one of my facial nerves, and that led to permanent left side facial paralysis. Um, from that point forward, my parents followed doctor's instructions, of course, trying to see if there was any way to regenerate that nerve, and really nothing was successful. Did some exploratory surgery. I had that done when I was three years old, just to have a surgeon look in there and and just see if there's anything viable and, and really what damage had been done. And it turned out that there was a lot of scar tissue around the neck nerve. And it was determined that it would never naturally uh, restore function. So uh, throughout the course of my my years, my parents, my dad in particular, would, you know, kind of research different options for me and other doctors in the field that with expertise in facial paralysis. And so I visited several doctors during my school age years and even as a teenager. So the procedure that surgeons often recommended to my parents for me was what's called facial reanimation surgery, which is a popular phrase in the facial paralysis community and it's essentially restoring function to the paralysis side by using um, our own nerve or our own donors the surgeon takes nerve from our our leg and um, muscle from our leg and vein from our leg and then um, kind of magically connects it all together and over time the the parts start moving and start working together to create a smile. It's a two-step process. Um, stage one is the cross-facial nerve graft. Stage two is the gracilis muscle transfer. And that basically was at, in my, uh, in the 80s and the 90s, and even now, kind of the, the basic go-to procedure to do. But back in the 80s, when I was born in 82, The procedure was still kind of being fine-tuned. Actually, it was a a lot being fine-tuned. And so the odds of it being successful, meaning that I would have function restored, just were not, they were not high enough. Um, I think my parents said that the odds are about 50-50 and that I would kind of be a guinea pig in the process. Mm. And my parents just were never comfortable with that. And so over the years, in my youth and then in, as a teen, I visited with other surgeons, experts in, in the field of facial paralysis. And, you know, time and time again, the, the facial reanimation procedure came up. And um, for one rhyme or reason or another, it just never was either the right time for me 
Oftentimes, surgeons would say that they were concerned about the social impact that having a change in my face, you know, what impact that would have on me. Um, and as I live my life as a, as a teenager, uh, so that was always something that, you know, we took into consideration. And then, you know, I met with a lot of great surgeons, but I also met with a couple that just really kind of freaked me out. You know, I, I didn't feel connected to them. I didn't feel like I could put my, myself in their care, even though they were very skilled at what they did. I, I didn't feel comfortable. And so that connection is so important uh, that you have that with your surgeon because you're trusting them with such a delicate thing and, and, and something that is so impactful. Absolutely. So, so let me, yeah. let me um, uh, stop you there for a second. And uh, just so people know we're friends, so we, we, uh, we can joke around and all that sort of stuff. But I, I wanted to get back in touch on growing up and going through school with mm-hmm. facial paralysis um were you bullied mm-hmm. what was that uh what was that like for you i definitely was bullied for sure mm-hmm. i felt very i think shy and later in life i realized that i carried a lot of shame growing up um about my appearance and so kids would you know ridicule me there was a couple bully names, you know, na- nicknames that, mm-hmm. that they had come up with for me. The school bus was always a pain because then kids could really target you. They could really get you one-on-one. Right. And that was a miserable time for me. And I remember an instance even in fifth grade where I a girl b- befriended me. And I remember she was good friends with another girl in our class. And I wanted to be friends with that other girl. And she just was really distant and kind of cold towards me. And and long story short, I learned from this new friend that she was no longer friends with that other girl because that other girl didn't want to be friends with me (laughs) because of the way that I looked. And instances like that. Yeah. Yeah. Instances like that. It's just really shocking. You know, you know, like I wasn't raised that way. I, you know, when you have uh, something that makes you quote unquote different, and I really believe that folks like us, you, you have a lot more compassion for people. Maybe you're a little more thoughtful. And so me growing up with facial paralysis, I, you know, like I just couldn't imagine not befriending someone just because, you know, they have a difference or they, you don't want to be standing next to them because what would other people think like I just don't connect with that kind of a mindset but me and this this girl and the girl that befriended me I mean we were best friends through fifth grade and you know so in sixth grade and then you know you find a new best friend and then that phases out and then you find a new best friend and you know that's kind of how my my junior high middle school uh, high school years went I always had a core friend or group of friends that made me think and feel like I was fantastic, thankfully. But so school was positive in that way for me. But bullies, there was neighborhood bullies. Just like you kind of feel like people just won't stop reminding you about that something's a little different and they just poke fun. And yeah, I, I definitely dealt with that all throughout school. But the bus was the worst. Mm -hmm. Did your parents have any, did they do anything as far as with the school, as far as reaching out to your teachers, uh, anything that parents might be able to do or what, what could, what would you say to maybe uh, a parent who has a child that has facial paralysis and is going to be entering school Mm -hmm. advice? That's a really good question because yeah, going through life, uh, my, my parents are, they're amazing and they, you know, always did their best. They always did their best, but I, I, in my home, we didn't really talk about my facial paralysis. And so I would encourage parents for sure to use that language, make it feel your, your child feel like it's okay to talk about it. It doesn't have to be a secret uh, because it's really not a secret. You're wearing your face every single day, but I grew up in, in not saying facial palsy. 
or facial paralysis because I felt like if I said it out loud, the people around me would then all of a sudden totally notice that I had it. And, and it, it's kind of weird because they were looking at me anyway and could see it, but I felt like if I identified it verbally out loud, it would just magnify their attention to it. Uh, when I met people and they'd ask how I or why I look the way I do, my parents said, just tell them you were born that way. So that's what that was my go-to spiel. I was just born that way. Hmm. And that satisfies some people, but a lot of people it doesn't. Um, so I encourage parents that just have that open communication with any child that has FP, practice with them out loud, role play those real life situations of when they encounter somebody that asks them and 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 role play it in different ways someone being kind of rude when asking someone just kindly asking you know role play those scenarios and then you know allow your child kind of help them come up with with uh, different ways to give feedback in those situations when you practice it then when it happens in real life then they can be more prepared and because there was nothing worse for me than someone calling me out and making fun of me and me just being on the spot like that and not having or knowing what to say. And I just wouldn't say anything. That's huge. And then when it comes to school picture day, that was my, one of my least favorite times (laughs) every year it came up. And then my second least favorite day was when the yearbook came out. And that was usually the last day of school. And my parents, or my mom in particular, would often write me a note because I would dread school picture day. And she'd write a little note for the photographer. I don't know what it said. I can't quite recall, but I think it was like, you know, position my daughter and to the left or to the right side. My right side would be my quote unquote good side. So kind of position me with my face forward that way. And back in that time, and maybe they still do it, it would always be like a row. Like our class would go and we'd walk in single file row. And then we would just be like, you know, sit down, take your picture, sit down, take the next picture. And the kids could see the person, the next kid that's going to take their picture. God, I'd sweat. I'd get red in the face. I hated it. And then giving the photographer a special note from my mom. <laughs> <laughs> That he'd have to open up and look at and then spend extra time posing me. Oh, it was just torture. I have a, uh, I I have a, I don't think I've told anyone that I, uh, some people know. I have a horror story from a a school picture and it's slightly off topic, but it's, it's kind of, I think it's funny. I think it was maybe second grade or, or third grade. We had the ones where they would do the straight ahead shot and then they would do the side profile. Uh, Uh and it would be in the same picture and for whatever reason, <laughs> when it came Sorry. in, everyone else's was fine. And the, somehow mine got blended. So I had my ear <laughs> sticking out of my forehead. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. Can you send that to me? I don't. I, need to see I, I, think oh. it's, I think it's been burned a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but my brother sure likes to bring that up uh, uh, from time to time. It was... <laughs> The funniest thing to everybody else but me. I was mortified. Here it is. Picture day. Okay, let's see everybody's picture. Yeah. And there's this big honking ear right in the middle of my forehead. I think that's you didn't where... didn't want to hand it out. No, I, I think that's where Picasso got his uh, inspiration. I'm not sure. But, uh, oh. <laughs> so, oh, Brian. So I thought that was... Oh, uh, that a picture story. <laughs> so... People have fun school picture stories all over the place, I'm sure. Yes. Facial paralysis or not, it doesn't matter. That's right. You went through teenage years and high school. When did you start to look into, like, seriously getting these surgeries? After high school, went off to college, and I would say that's really where I found myself. And uh, I had, you know, just to put it out there, I had a depression. I experienced depression. Um, when I was 14, I got diagnosed. So when I got into college, that was really like a discovery period for me where for me, my, my major was human development or child development rather, um, and and family science. And I learned so much about just 
the lifespan and how people can grow and change. And, you know, if you don't like something about yourself, meaning, you know, characteristic, not necessarily physical, but just a quality, you know, you can, you can take steps and there's tools that you can use to change it. And so I, I was feeling empowered. So after college, I think I, I would have been about 22, I did my own personal research and was empowered to check out one of the Mayo Clinics and see what's going on now. Because the last time prior to that that I had visited in person with a surgeon was when I was 14. So eight years later, I kind of felt the momentum. And I honestly, too, Brian, I think that I was just sick and tired of looking the way that I did. Really depressed about it. And I was just tired of it. And I didn't want it anymore. I wanted it to change. So I went, scheduled an appointment, met with the surgeon, and no bedside manner at all. And again, I mentioned earlier that if you're trusting your face, you know, in someone's hands. And mm-hmm. if there's not a connection there with your surgeon, speaking for myself, it just can't happen. Like, I, 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 you know, I couldn't move forward with it. And that was exactly what happened in this scenario. I actually felt embarrassed in that doctor's office. And I remember crying hysterically when, it, when I was done. So I tabled the issue again for a few years. So during um, that time through high school, college, did you do any dating or anything like that? I did date, and my counselor would say that I had a successful, (laughs) quote-unquote, dating history, you could say. You know, I did have boys that liked me, and yeah, I had a boyfriend in middle school, probably too serious. I mean, I should have been just hanging out and having fun with my friends, but I think that because of my insecurities about my face, I kind of latched on, maybe, to this relationship. And so kind of unhealthy, but it it was good. Um, and we lasted until I think I was about 17. And then um, meeting with friends, I met someone else, another guy. And, you know, that was a couple years. And then I met my current husband, Kyle. And I met him just at a party, you know, just like normal ways that a normal, and I say these things like with quotes, a normal, <laughs> typical person where you'd meet somebody, you know, and, and that's how I met someone, just like any other girl would. And I was always self-conscious, though, of course, and, and kind of like thinking these guys that I thought were cute weren't going to like me. But for, somehow some of them did, you know, <laughs> <laughs> some of them did. And we dated and we had our uh, our time together and the, the, my husband um, what really attracted me to him is that when I talk, when I talk to him, he always looked at me in my eyes and he didn't stare at my mouth because that's an insecurity that I, that I even now have. And I know a lot of facial paralysis folks can relate to that. And he never did that. And he still doesn't do that. I mean, this is 14 years later here. You know, we dated for nine to married for four and a half and he still looks at me in the eyes. And I love that factor about him considering my condition. It just, it makes me feel good. Do you find, just bringing up the the staring, I I found, especially in the beginning when I was just dealing with it, whenever I would meet somebody, I would immediately look at their mouth and like, and look at their face and their eye and see if, if there was anything different or if they were like me. Did you do that at all or? No, and maybe because I've had it, it was really my whole life. That is all I knew. And so in, I'm sure, Brian, that folks in a similar situation as you that got facial paralysis later in life, maybe you would be able to um, not agree with you on that, but like experience mm-hmm. that too. Um, whereas for me... I was always just looking at their eyes to see what direction they were looking at me. So you, you, now you're into to college and you're doing that and you have, you went and get some surgery. Yes. So, okay. So kind of the big monumental moment that a lot of folks in the facial paralysis community had was when they saw Dr. Uh, Ziza Day on the Oprah show <laughs> mm-hmm. with uh, Mary Jo Botafuco. 
that was a great episode, and my mom happened to be watching it that day. And listened to Dr. Zizide talk about some of the techniques that he had used to help Mary Jo. And my mom called me and said, Andrea, this is what I saw on TV, and I think that this surgeon can help you. And I was, you know, feeling like, hey, that's that's exciting, you know. And I would have been, I think I was 24 at that age. And so I contacted Dr. Zizide's office, scheduled a consultation, um, and I should mention, I live in Fargo, North Dakota, so, um, you know, had to travel quite a bit. He's all out there in California and uh, decided that my next step would not be facial reanimation surgery. I was hesitant about it at that time. You know, I had a lot of anxiety just dealing with a lot of personal things at that time, and I didn't feel like I could manage all that would come with going through this big transition. So I, I, I held back. But the next step that, you know, he agreed, I said I would like to improve my symmetry because having years and years of paralysis, you know, your your face droops, your eye droops, and I had I had droop. And it, it really bothered, bothered me. It was like the weight of the droop bothered me. And so I was really looking to, <clears throat> to have that corrected. And, and, and so... I flew out with my family to Beverly Hills and had a static sling suspension completed. And that is where Dr. Zizide took some fascia, some tissue from my outer thigh, cut it into three strips, and attached the end, uh, one end of one strip to, like, my jaw area. The second strip was towards my mouth area, and the third strip was towards my, my nose. And then grabbed the opposite ends all together and attached it to my temple area. And so that created a lift. He also gave me a little kind of smile dimple of sorts. And when I found after that surgery, I I would smile more. Because my mouth was just naturally now, the left side was just naturally raised. And so, yeah, I, I was kind of comfortable with a little bit more of a smile. So was so grateful for him. And he was like my hero. I just, you know, was so grateful for that experience. And then years later, when I was 31, I got the itch, kind of, to re-explore facial reanimation surgery. And what helped me make that decision is, you know, I'd mentioned that in my early 20s, I had a lot of anxiety. I had some personal issues that I was working through, and I just didn't feel like I had the stability, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, that I could go through a major transition with my face. But through counseling and things like that, you know, I advocated counseling, having someone to to talk about your feelings. And I brought up facial paralysis, my, my condition to my counselor. And I said, I'm looking into having the facial reanimation surgery, but I need help dealing with it because when you have the surgery, your transition is very public. You know, you wear your face every day. People are going to see it change. And when you think that after the surgery, your face is done changing, then it changes a little more as it heals. And so I needed to know that I had her support in place, that if I pursued that surgery, that she would help walk me through the different stages. And I totally had her support. So once that was in place, I, I did some research and I was very excited to do a Google search and find Dr. Samir Mardini. He is a plastic surgeon on the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And he coordinates, uh, he has a facial reanimation clinic where it's not just him meeting with facial paralysis patients, but he has developed a team there's a neurologist on board, there's physical therapist, there is an ophthalmologist, and then there's all these other support staff that work together as a team so that when you meet with Dr. Mardini, you are also meeting with these other experts that each, you know, have expertise in an aspect of facial paralysis. And so I was all for that. It felt very comprehensive. So I met Dr. Mardini and had two days of very, very thorough appointments. 
He said, I'd be a great candidate for facial reanimation surgery. I felt emotionally and, you know, I felt prepared. And I had knew that I had a care plan with my counselor. So I was ready, you know, I was ready to move forward. And in August of 2015, I had stage one of the surgery, which is the cross-face nerve graft. And then in July of 2016, um, I had a weight exchange completed. So I had had a weight originally inserted when I met with Dr. Azizadeh and had the status, static sling procedure. I also had a, a, a weight put in. And that weight had shifted over the years. And so I got it replaced. In July 2016, which was kind of a heavier one, and it was positioned above my eye, which has given me much better closure. And they also did some tightening of my lower left eyelid because, as I mentioned earlier, the droop is kind of inevitable. And so it helped tighten things up. And then August, I had the big finale surgery, um, August 2016, and where they transferred the vein and the muscle. And within, I think it was two and a a half months, I think it was December 2nd, actually, 2016, I had a little twinge of movement. Wow. And I was very excited. I downplayed it. Like, ah, I was able to do that all along, probably. (laughs) But no, I I bit down, and I had some movement um, to the left of my nose. And I should say that the procedure that Dr. Mardini did incorporated using my bite function on my left side to also create movement. So I have the muscle and the nerve that's fresh in there. And then I also can bite down and create that movement too, or help create movement. So where did, very uh, cool. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, Amazing. You must have been over the moon. Just really yeah. quickly, where did where did they take the muscle and the vein from? If people who, sure. who don't, my, aren't familiar with it. Good question. So my nerve came from the back of my leg, my, my calf. And so I, I do have scars kind of up and down the my left calf. I know there's other procedures where it can just be a little tiny mark on the on the ankle. And so there's different ways that the surgeons go about it, but it's usually from the leg because there is a nerve there that isn't, doesn't have any function, uh, function property, so to say, so you can live without it there. Um, and so they, they, they took that. And then my muscle came from my inner right thigh. Yeah. So nice, pretty scars. <laughs> <laughs> they healed up well. They and healed up well. And you would, t- you would do that again? I would do this surgery in a heartbeat. I am just like over the moon, I'd say in love with my care team at Mayo Clinic. I am in so, so in awe of just like how humble they are and they do such great work and they're so caring and that comprehensive kind of approach, it feels really good in the heart, you know, and that's what I needed to move forward. I needed the bedside manner, as they often say, of my surgeon, knowing that he was going to take care of me. And I asked him point blank, because I know he's a father, and I said, Dr. Mardini, if your daughter had facial paralysis, would you, would you consider, would you recommend the surgery for her? And he said, yes, absolutely. And I just felt connected with him and everyone that I met with. So I, I can't emphasize it enough. That for me, that was the number one importance. I mean, list of important things to have in place, it was that. That was number one. And then everything else just kind of fell into place, you know, having the insurance and having enough time off from work to be able to do it. Um, everything had to align for me. What would you say to someone who has facial paralysis and is looking for treatment options, whether it's the static sling or facial reanimation? What, what advice would you give them? Be open to the process and, and learning from folks like Brian and I, you know, um, about the condition, first and foremost, learn and learn about the condition. And then the different treatment options, yeah, it's on the internet. There are support groups out there online. In fact, Brian and I are both in uh, a couple of them. Mm-hmm. And 
with regards to the support groups that are online, they're great. However, everyone has had their own experience. And so, at least for myself, I've noticed that or I can see how maybe someone wanting to pursue a procedure might feel a little bit held back because maybe it didn't work well for one person in the group. And maybe that one person in the group has just been very vocal about sharing that experience. So with that said, the procedures for facial paralysis, have they really come a long way with it. And it has been successful. And how you define success, is really going to be up to you. I'm still defining it. I do have function now on my left side. It's amazing. It's so amazing. But as I settle into my face, I still am. It's still changing. I I find myself saying, oh, well, I wish this looked a little different or that. And we're just always critiquing ourselves. And there does come a point where we need to stop. And we're all not symmetrical. (laughs) No one is perfectly symmetrical. And when exploring options, just be open. Don't fill yourself with stories of people that maybe it didn't work out for. Find people that it did. Talk to them. And and yeah, just seek people out. There's a great support community in the California area, but there's a facial paralysis and Bell's Palby Institute, even there's a website, that you can go and learn more information and you can connect with other people that have the condition. And that would be my number one recommendation is to connect with someone else that has facial paralysis. It's possible. And if you only know one, it can be Brian or I, but we know others. And so we can help connect. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I have to ask this just because it just popped into my head. Is there any words that can describe what it feels like to be able to have function now on the left side after not having it for 30 plus years? Oh, when you asked that, my first thought was kind of miracle. I felt the reason, one big reason I pushed forward with this too is that I would regret not having tried this procedure. If if there is an option and I had the means and a good team to to make to restore function on my my uh, bad side so to say, I would regret not doing that and not giving myself the opportunity to have a uh, a more functional smile in my life. I would be 70 years old and I know that I would look back and regret that I didn't at least try. So Ask me the question again, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> is there any... I lost it. Uh, what, what kind of emotion, you know, is there any word that you can use to d- just describe, you know, yeah. what, what it's like to have that feeling after not having it for 30 plus years? Yes, yes. Pictures are a little more enjoyable. <laughs> I, I think uh, us facial paralysis folks in general are not big picture fans. Um, I'm not a, all into the selfies, you know, I'm right. not, and I'm pro- I'll never probably will be because I do have my insecurities and that's okay. But I am more pleased with my appearance uh, when I look in the mirror. I am more confident when I'm speaking to others. Part of my job in my field is that I do presentations. I am more confident about myself in, in those situations. And you know what? Confidence is something that you you wear. You fake it till you make it. And personality goes a long way. So, you know, be yourself and with embracing the changes that come along with, with these transitions to your faces, because there's going to be a lot of transitions, give yourself a break. Self-care is so important. and uh, But just really give yourself a break. It's not an overnight success kind of thing. It takes time. And I am very pleased with my outcome. Do I wish maybe it was perfect? I hate saying that word because it's completely unattainable. But just like anyone else, I have my insecurity, insecurities too. And, you know, we're, we're so hard on ourselves. So, yeah, in a heartbeat. It feels like a miracle. It's a blessing. I, am, I feel so blessed that... I had this opportunity and that I had the team that I do working with me. Well, Andrea, we're going to wrap it up, but I 
always love talking to you. You were such a, a positive and inspirational person. And I, I always just have a blast uh, talking with you, whether it's in a, a group support online or, or just through Facebook or, or whatever in person. And can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing about your story and your inspiration and your wisdom. So thank you so much for coming oh, on today. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right. And we will talk to you really soon. Bye.